Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The D Show by making a donation in the link below. And don't forget, as I asked you to do already, if you haven't, subscribe right now. What guided you, what struck you to really think about this? Well, many people are just thinking about money, mm. maybe fame, being cool, going to the latest parties. What triggered you to think more serious and to start living purpose? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, I mean, I guess it's, it's uh, interesting to me that somebody would not think about this. But I, I guess you're right. I mean, some people don't, don't think about this. I think that uh, it's probably because they're, I mean, I think if you distract yourself, I mean, you, if you become so distracted by these more superficial issues, uh, eventually you forget that anything more significant exists. Uh, the distraction becomes a reality. I think it's a very hollow reality, unfortunately. But um, I think when I was younger, especially when I was, when I was a teenager, I just felt these existential issues very, very deeply. I felt incredible anxiety about, um, you know, my mortality. I, I, I needed to know that there was some, some, uh, something I could do. There was some reason for my existence that wasn't just going to cease uh, when I died. Um, and so I thought about this so much when I was in high school. I mean, I really just, it, 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 it almost incapacitated me, the anxiety. Um, and it was very upsetting. I was very emotionally, um, I was really, I mean, I think I was really messed up as, as, a, as a teenager. Um, yeah, I, I didn't affect my schoolwork. I didn't, you know, do anything stupid, thank God. But I mean, I, I, was, I think I was a miserable person. I was very, very upset all the time. I was very sad. And I felt that extremely strongly. Um, and so I, I lived in California when I was in high school, and I... I I used to just, um, you know, go and wander. We lived near these uh, hills, this national park. I'd go and wander in the hills, and I would just, I would just think about these things. I'd try to find some kind of connection to something bigger than me. I was raised uh, Episcopalian Christian, but uh, we didn't really have religion in our house. We went to church every Sunday, but it was not. It was more like you go to church Sunday, you do that, and you come home, and there's nothing about the God in, in the house really. And so I had, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, didn't find any investment, any interest in that background. And so when I, when I learned, when I went to college, when I learned about Islam, then it really, this struck me as the kind of thing I was, I had always been searching for. I'd always known had to be there. And uh, yeah, I mean, at, at that age in my life, I think, you know, it's funny when I think now, if I were to, you know, if I were to learn about Islam now, um, I don't know if what I, I mean, it would be, I can't imagine what it would be like to go, like let's say you're married, you have kids, you have a job, you have a whole life, and then suddenly you, you, you take on this whole other religion. I, I think that would be incredibly difficult. Um, when I did it, I was young, I was idealistic, I didn't have any attachments, and I, it gave me the, I mean, I was, I'm very grateful that I learned about Islam at that time, and I was able to make that choice at a time it was easy. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. What do you think is an academic? Your professor? Yeah. Also, was it uh, Georgetown? Georgetown, yeah, Georgetown yeah, University. At Georgetown University. You know, at Oxford, in Oxford University, they, they did a, um, a study, I believe it was in 2011, mm -hmm. in the anthropology department. Mm -hmm. They had 57 researchers, 40 different studies in 20 different countries. And what they had concluded from investigating this, now this is not a biased study where maybe a Christian did it or a Muslim. These are prim primarily, uh, it's a secular university. And they concluded that belief is something innate in the human being. This is their study. And Atheism is something acquired. Disbelief is something acquired. Now, you as an academic, you, do you see, you know, a lot of people, they get cast out from that inner circle of the community of academics if they argue the design mm -hmm. argument. But if this is something that is, is um, uh, innate in the human being, is something that's natural, why do you think such movements, people are giving 
time to such movements as the New Atheism. So I think that uh, in the in the in the West, in um, the modern West, the uh, a lot of animosity towards religion is actually um, kind of morphed out of animosity towards Catholicism mm. and towards um, kind of superstitious social uh, practices. So if you look at the, this whole life idea, for example, that science and religion are in clash, this is called the clash thesis in the history of science. No actual historian of science actually believes that religion and, society and science are incompatible. And it's just a silly idea that, that was only in the popular media. Um, but what you see is that it actually starts, especially this clash thesis, really starts as a tax on Catholicism in the United States. Um, and so it's not really against, it, 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 it starts out as an attack on a certain kind of religion and then it just kind of expands more and more to become an attack on religion overall. And uh, it's based on this idea that if you're religious, then somehow you're not, um, you know, you're not able to be objective, you're not able to be intelligent, you're not able to be reasonable, and you won't be able to discover scientific truths um, or social scientific truths. And uh, then a couple, I think it was about two years ago, there was a study at, at Harvard about, uh, you know, do scientists tend to be atheists? And uh, I think that the, the study found that you know, they looked at scientists at like Harvard and Yale or something and, and found that, you know, they tended to be atheists more than religious people. Then, but then when they, another study was done uh, two, two, a year later, it looked at, um, scientists across the board, you know, not just in these few universities. I found actually that they're just the same as re regular population. Um, so what you're really talking about is not necessarily whether uh, someone who learns about science or learns about scholarship, that that somehow pushes them towards atheism, but actually it's just a specific community. It's just a kind of a network of people. It's almost a, a culture within certain universities of of, of atheism. And so it's really, it's not really something that is essentially a result of people who've somehow learned to look at the world in a more accurate way and that makes them think that there's no God or something. It's actually just like, you know, if we decide to all wear a same color t-shirt and then all our friends wear that same color t-shirt, we only let people into our club who wear the same color t-shirt. It's really just a, like a part of a, a badge in a certain or a feature of a certain subculture. So that's, and uh, when, you, when you realize that, and I mean, I, I certainly realized that when I was in graduate school, that um, there is nothing, a lot of the, the, let's say, the people who talk about early Islamic history or the nature of the Quran. I mean, just, the, the, I don't know if you were following this uh, controversy about the Birmingham Quran that they discovered, these pages of the Quran they discovered yes. at the University of Birmingham. And, you know, they, uh, it was, uh, first it came out, this is from the time of the Prophet, and then, you know, uh, then somebody came and said, it comes from before the Prophet's time. And, it, you know, if you looked at the way some of these, uh, you know, not all, but some Western scholars were looking at it, who just, what you see is that they're, they have a, f a faith commitment that the Quran cannot be intact. They, that's that's a, a, an article of faith for them. And it doesn't matter what outrageous rational steps they have to take to, to reach that conclusion, they will take those steps. And what was fascinating is you, you looked at their, you know, one second they say the Quran comes much from much later than the time of the Prophet. Now they're saying it comes from before the time of the Prophet. Is it, it, you look at their accusation is that religious people aren't objective, that they don't look at data, they just have these assumptions and they build uh, everything on those assumptions, those faith assumptions. Well, you look at these people, they're doing exactly the same thing. I and mean, this is just as religious, this is just a, as faith based an activity as what they're criticizing. And so when you look at a lot of these new atheists and their just obsession with criticizing religion, obsession with criticizing Islam and Muslims especially, is that they are, they're not, they, this is an article of faith for them. And they will twist whatever data in the world they have to twist to fit that. And uh, I think this is important to, to tell people and for people to understand because they think that somehow if you're scientific and you're objective, if you're religious, you're not objective. No, neither of these groups are objective. People always have their pre-existing biases and then they will, will, will shape the world according to those. Uh, th this is amazing that we see this kind of research, and this is science. I mean, this is where they did this research. You had also uh, Dr. Barnett, one of the key researchers uh, in the anthropology department at yeah, Oxford, 
who, who said that if you were to take a handful of children, this is his opinion, mm -hmm. uh, and throw them on an island, that they would grow up believing in God. Mm. And like Ibn Tufail. Who? Like this uh, Hay ibn Yaqdhan, this uh, famous story by uh, Ibn Bajah. Tell us about it. Oh, I think, I mean, I'm just, I think it's by Ibn Bajah. The, yeah. He said pretty like much a similar same thing. 10th or 11th, I think 10th yeah. century. Uh, I'm just a little rusty on this, so yeah, no if problem. you're listening to this and I'm making mistakes, then you look it up yeah. and correct it. So he, he has this story of, uh, it's an existing story that you see other people write about too, but it's called Hay ibn Yaqdhan, Hay, the living one, the son of the awakened one. Yes. And it's this child who's born on this desert island or lives on a desert island, and he basically... The author just describes the process that this child goes through of, of using his reason, kind of like Abraham in the Quran, and looking at the world, looking, observing nature, observing the natural realities around them. And he comes to this, using his reason and observation, he comes to this uh, belief in one, one God. And kind of then there's certain ethical uh, uh, consequences, uh, ethical principles that follow from that uh, consequentially. And then he, you know, finally meets someone, comes someone, comes to the island, and he finds out that actually his belief is the same as these other religions. So, I, I mean, that's an an old um, an old idea, uh, and I, I think it's a correct idea, and I'm, I'm glad to know that it's it's now being, um, you know, bolstered by uh, these uh, these uh, you know social scientific mm -hmm. uh, surveys, but because I mean human beings, and you know, this is what uh, Muslims that were taught, which is that you know you have. Uh, you know, you're born to, you already in pre-time, you already said to God, when God said, am I not your Lord, you already said, yes, you're my Lord. We've already all said that in our, in our existences. I hope you enjoyed this week's show as much as I did. Thank you for tuning in. Come back next week where we're going to go ahead and do part two. Subscribe right now if you haven't already. And we'll see you until next time. Peace be with you. Salam alaikum. And don't forget. As I asked you to do already, if you haven't, subscribe right now.